Hello, everyone. Welcome to this ESGE satellite webinar series with the help of Sonoscape and the European Society of Gastro Intestinal Endoscopy. You see, we start with some music of hope. My name is Helmut Neumann from Germany, and it's really a great pleasure that you today are all with us to talk about uh, what shapes the future of endoscopy, what is the emerging evidence, and what are the new perspectives. And I'm very, very happy to introduce my colleagues today because it's a multi-center initiative. Today we have Professor Cesara Hassan here from uh, no. Italy. Cesara, hello. Hello, Almut. Hello, we have uh, hello. Professor Lucian Negrano from uh, Romania in Bucharest. Welcome, Lucian, hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, and also we have uh, Pedro Rosson, Professor Rosson from most beautiful Malaga and uh, Spain. Welcome so much, Pedro. Hello, hello, thank El you. Hello, and later on, we also hope that uh, Professor Marc Giovannini will join us from Marseille in France. And uh, this webinar today will be a very special one because we have experts from various countries in Europe, but also we have you. So what we are doing today is not only talking about emerging evidence, but we also ask you to participate actively. So we have a voting poll during this webinar so you can actively participate in this symposium. And our aim is to just give you all the details within just one hour. So I think we want to definitely start. But before we are starting again, I want to deeply thank Sonoscape company for this initiative, providing us here with the latest knowledge. And of course, also the European Society of Gastrointestinal uh, Endoscopy, the ESGE, for supporting this event. So Cesare, maybe we can start with your talk about novel light spectrum and contribution to an increased detection rate. I agree that this partnership between Sonoscape and ESGE will be long lasting and we are so excited uh, about it. So as you know, what I do is uh, mainly screening colonoscopy and uh, there is still uh, an uh, um, unsatisfactory variability in uh, the normal detection rate uh, across uh, the all endoscopists. You can find one adenoma in 20% of the patient uh, and some other endoscopies in 80% uh, of the patient. And this has been associated with the uh, interval correcta cancer. If you do screening colonoscopy, you know that most of the difference across the endoscopy is related uh, with uh, a diminutive flat adenoma. You can spend seven, eight um, minutes of withdrawal and the only adenoma that you find is this lesion. If you miss this lesion, you will not find another one in this patient. Next slide. So the problem is why are we missing uh, the uh, smallest? And there are, of course, uh, several uh, uh, reasons. First, it may be the inadequate cleansing. Secondly, maybe we are rushing too much. Third, our technique of rotation and tip movement is not enough. Of course, we only like a high definition scope, but the, the main problem is probably the inadequate level of contrast between the normal and the adenomatous mucosa. Next. So the main issue is whether we can use advanced imaging to increase the contrast between what is neoplastic and what is healthy. In the Sonoscape platform, I like to use the BIST that is a physical and optical uh, filter in order to create a blue light. You will hear a lot from Helmut about the use of this light for characterization. The problem is, should we use a blue light um, for detection. Next slide. So this is uh, an example. You may see, can you activate the video, Claire, please? Uh, you may see that uh, on the left, we have white light. Uh, on the right, we have uh, BIST. We have the increased um, uh, vascularity of the lesion that create a contrast that simplify the detection. Should we use uh, this blue light for our screening colonoscopy in average risk subject? Next slide. Go next, Claire. So the answer may be 
yes, because um, the blue base um, chromo endoscopy can increase the contrast between the normal and the adenomatous mucosa, and it will uh, simplify the adenoma detection. There is uh, a big literature with the uh, use of NBI by Olympus uh, showing uh, that if the level of cleansing is adequate, uh, you can increase by 30% uh, the uh, detection of adenoma when you use a blue light like uh, VIST on the Sonoscape uh, platform. However, next. Next again, I want to be honest uh, with you. I don't like to use a blue based chrome endoscopy for my screening colonoscopy because, uh, for instance, it emphasizes too much the stool that appears as red as the lesion. In addition, it is uh, too dark, and this increases by at least one to two minutes the withdrawal time. And you need to be very close in order not to miss the periphery of the image. Next slide. So the paradigm shift by a Sonoscape and other company is to use uh, not a blue base, but a bright chrome endoscopy for detection, a special light only to increase um, a detection. Next slide. In the platform of um, a Sonoscape, this has been named as SFI. In this light, you still have uh, the enhancement by the blue light, but there is uh, a new red component uh, that generates a bright background that is similar to white light. So you can work for hours uh, without getting uh, um, exhausted. Can you activate the video? What I like um, of um, SFI is that what is red become reddish and what is white become whitish. This is extremely clear in this video, always of the same adenoma. On the left, you have the blue uh, base VIST. On the right, you have SFI. You may see that SFI is much more similar to white light, but you still have the contrast of the blue base uh, component. So the idea is to use this uh, for um, a screening colonoscopy. Next slide. Next, uh, okay. So why not to use this? It preserves the same contrast between adenoma and normal mucosa as the dark chrome endoscopy. There is no interference from the stool that are green and blood that remain red as preserve all the other color. And there is a bright background in the peripheral part. So you don't need to increase uh, your withdrawal time. Next slide. We don't have uh, direct data with SFI, but this is a study done with a very similar technology, is LSI by Fuji. And in this trial that we did uh, in a fit positive program, uh, you may see, can you click uh, Claire? that, um, uh, no, no, go back, sorry, that there is a 20% increase uh, in the adenoma detection rate when using this bright chrome endoscopy to detect more adenoma. So this is what we recommend. Of course, next slide, the future is about uh, combining uh, advanced imaging with uh, artificial intelligence. Can you activate this video? This is a uh, an historical video, the first done with uh, GI Genius by Medtronic on Sonoscape a platform with the SFI. And you may see how the box detects the lesion. So will SFI uh, help uh, GI Genius in detecting polyp uh, or not? This is the next uh, challenge. Of course, uh, artificial intelligence is able to increase by 40% uh, uh, the ADR. So in conclusion, Colonoscopy is effective, but too many lesions are missed. Blue-based chrome endoscopy is uh, theoretically appealing, but is unfeasible in everyday routine. But the bright chrome endoscopy as SFI is the way that I recommend, is the way that I use uh, in my routine. Thanks, Helmut, and back to you.
Thank you so much, Tira. It's always a great pleasure um, listening to your fantastic lectures and uh, learning so much from you. And we, thankfully, we're seeing so often during those even challenging times, uh, at least online. Uh, look so much forward to seeing you in person again, hopefully soon again, and all of you, because uh, we have already more than 280 participants at the moment. So thanks for all of you joining us in this challenging times. And again, thanks to Sonoscape and thanks to the ESGE. Shazara, most recently you have um, released the final, well, the last guidelines on colorectal screening, cancer screening as well. Do you see any idea of using SFI in the future? Should we maybe use really detection, dedicated detection tool to increase our detection rates? Yes, I feel that uh, we are not using uh, in the future uh, white light. We will be using SFI or uh, whatever is uh, new, but uh, white light will not be in the next 10 years in the field of colonoscopy. Thank you. So it shapes the future of endoscopy, as you can see. Thank you so very much again, Cesare. Thanks, so, thank you so much. So we go to the next talk. Before getting ready for AI, for artificial intelligence, I want to show you the new valid classification, a smart way for in vivo characterization of colon lesions. And um, for this one, we, we are looking forward to get the, um, the, get the new presentation. So as you can see, we have a specific challenge in the diagnosis, and this includes lesions which are very flat, which are hidden, so located, for example, behind the colonic folds, or even located in chronically inflamed mucosa, like this is the case for patients suffering from inflammatory bowel disease. So indeed, there is a very strong need for advanced endoscopic imaging techniques for both detection and also, of course, for characterization of colorectal lesions. So Sonoscape is now offering a new optical chromoendoscopy system, and uh, Cesaro already has highlighted this new optical chromoendoscopy system for us. Again, we have two specific types of chromoendoscopy. One is called spectral focused imaging, a tool dedicated for detection of lesions and the second one is the so-called VIST or VIST versatile intelligence staining technology and this is a mode specifically dedicated to detection so you can see we have high definition white light the SFI mode for detection and the VIST mode for characterization of lesions so always for us very important of course is the question is it now effective to use image enhanced endoscopy and specifically even those tools for detection and characterization. We just want to highlight this short video so you can see that there is a lesion and now we have switched to SFI. Already Cesare has highlighted the color change here. The red colors are increased and then you can clearly demarcate the lesion. Afterwards, you're switching to the VIST mode and after switching to VIST, you can clearly identify the surface pit pattern morphology of this uh, colorectal polyp and you can clearly identify indeed that this is an hyperplastic lesion. Like for every new technology, Dear colleagues, uh, we are always asking the same question. Is it now comparable to existing ones? So Sonoscape for most of us is a new company, although we have to state that Sonoscape is strongly supporting the ESGE now since 2000, I think, 18, uh, or maybe even 17, because they have been present at all the conferences. And unfortunately, this year we have been not able to meet in person at the ESGE days, but of course we still hope that we'll be able to meet next year and to see you all in person again. So is a new technique now comparable to the existing ones? And we have done an international multi-center controlled trial from China, Thailand, uh, Italy, of course, Professor Hassan participated as well, Russia and Germany as well. And the aim was to investigate the key performance parameters of colonoscopy of Sonoscape and other established brands. So we have had a look at uh, the performance parameters, including the sequel intubation time, the total examination time, and the number of polyps detected. So most important, as you can see here on this table, and I only want to highlight the result that there was no significant difference noted for the sequel intubation time, neither for the withdrawal time or the polyp detection rate between the individual brands. So Sonoscape, the new brand, was not inferior to Olympus or even Pentax Medical, as you can see here in this study. And also there was no significant differences in the adenoma detection rate in between the subgroup analyzers. So the question of course now is, 
what is next? And you can see this is the uh, latest video processor here of uh, the Sonoscape HD 550 for LED system. And uh, what we have done now in the recent month is we have developed a new classification. And it was Cesare's idea to came up with this uh, great name of Velid. It's the vist appearance of colon lesions and histology prediction. And what we have done with this valid classification is we just try to make a very easy classification for in vivo prediction of colorectal polyp histology. So what we have done, we looked at the surface pattern morphology. We're looking if it's regular, if it's irregular, or if it's ulcerated. The second one is we're evaluating the pit pattern morphology and we are predicting if the pit pattern is round, so we can predict an hyperplastic polyp if the pit pattern appearance is a tubular one, a villus or a tubular villus one, and then this classification because the image quality is so crystal clear, we're able not only to predict that this is an adenoma, but we can predict the individual type of the adenoma as well. And then finally, if the surface pattern is ulcerated and the pit pattern is not visible, then we can predict that this is a cancer lesion and this is the valid classification. And I want to show you one example and then I want to ask you to do a poll as well here. For the first time ever, we want you to participate as well. We have now 294 uh, uh, participants here. So we want to ask you to participate in this webinar as well because we're doing so many for you, um, but we want to actively do it together. So an example here is this polyp, a large polyp, and we're looking at the surface pattern and the surface pattern, despite it's a large polyp, it's regular. The second one is we are looking at the pits. The pits are round here, as you can see. And despite this is a large polyp here, we can predict it's a hyperplastic lesion and this is valid and this is true. Another example is this polyp here. Again, we're looking at the surface. The surface is now irregular because regular means we have pits like at the normal colonic epithelium. So you can always compare it to the surrounding. It looks different, so it's irregular. And then we can predict the pit pattern morphology here as well. I would say it's definitely a tubular one. And again, this is valid. And then finally, of course, Again, we are comparing this lesion and this looks again irregular. We have some villus components here and then we can predict a tubular villus adenoma. And then finally, again, you're predicting here the surface pattern morphology, which is ulcerated. We're always looking at the most worst part of a polyp and then we're looking at the pit pattern and we cannot see any pits here on the surface of the lesion and then the valid classification predicts indeed that this is a cancer. So now it is your time to participate in this. So we have over 302 participants now, including uh, us as a faculty. So one, two, three, four, five faculty members and 303 participants online. And I want to show you now the next uh, poll. So you can now vote by yourself if this is a hyperplastic lesion, if it's a tubular adenoma, if it's a tubular villus adenoma, or a cancer. And uh, this is a lesion. So at, at the next poll, you will have the idea to click A, B, C, or D on your, uh, on your screen. And then you can first look at the surface pattern, if it's regular or irregular, at the pit, and then you can come to a conclusion. So we'll show you the poll now. So unfortunately, I cannot see the poll, but we have tested it yesterday. Ah, now I can see it. Oh, wow. Oh. Okay, so you can now vote by yourself. Unfortunately, I cannot vote by myself. I got a message here, I cannot vote. But you can vote by yourself and then we can identify. Most of you are saying it's a tubular adenoma. And uh, some of you are saying it's a tubular villus type of adenoma. Very few are saying it's a cancer because maybe you have looked at the central part of this image. So this idea of this polyp, if you can gain me control back of the slides, this is a tubular adenoma. So let's go to a second vote. So again, please have a look at this polyp. Again, please have a look at the surface pattern, at the pit pattern, and then please come to your conclusion when we start the poll now. 
Again, it's very important for us always to identify uh, the pits looking very similar to the surrounding mucosa, or is it irregular? If it's regular, then there might be a hyperplastic lesion, otherwise maybe something more worse. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. It's the first time ever we are doing really something like this. So most of you are voting it's a hyperplastic lesion and um, then we'll have a look at the final result. Again, important, the surface pattern, the pit pattern, and then the conclusion. And in this case, it was a tubal adenoma, although I agree uh, there have been some parts of a mixed uh, polyp. In this case, there was a hyperplastic lesion as well. So this is a large lesion. Again, hyperplasia, tubal adenoma, tubular villus adenoma, or cancer. And we have tried to choose real life polyps as well. So again, you can vote. And of course, it's important always to look at the most worst part of the lesion. I would suggest this is something here like this. Is there a surface pattern available? Can we see the pit pattern here? And then let's go to a conclusion in this poll number three, hyperplasia, tubal adenoma, tubular villus, or cancer. And I'm very curious what you're choosing. Uh, most of you have chosen the cancer. And of course, we can go to the conclusion now. And thanks so much, Claire, for this support in the back, um, because uh, Claire is helping us here very much from the ESGE. And now we can have a look at the final result. Um, but I can already say it has been a cancer, of course, uh, it's a no surface pattern, it's an ulcerated surface pattern morphology and no pits are visible. So number four, let's have a look at this. And I think there might be a learning curve now as well. So what about the surface when we're starting the poll now? What about the pit pattern? And uh, is the pit looking the same like the surrounding mucosa? If it's not, then we say it's irregular. And then if it's irregular, it must be either an adenoma. And then the type is what about the idea here, if it's tubular branches or is it maybe a tubular villus one, or maybe you feel it's looking different. Most of you have choose it's a tubular villus adenoma. And uh, of course you are correct with the idea of an adenoma. And if we come to the final conclusion, we can see that in this case, indeed, it has been a tubular villus adenoma. So you can see, indeed, there is also a learning curve, and it seems to be a very short one, because honestly, we have never done this fall before. Yeah, and unfortunately, we can't see each other in person, but you're doing great. So this is, uh, we have two more. Yeah, so this is number five. We can already start the poll, please. So please have a look at the surface, at the pit, and then come to, uh, come to a conclusion. <clears throat> Is it regular or not? Ah, we have missed the poll, I guess. <laughs> Here it is again, and we'll show you the polyp again. Thanks so much, Claire. Hyperplasia, tubular adenoma, tubular villus, or cancer. Is it looking the same for the surface pattern? And you are saying it's a tubular adenoma. My gosh, I'm so proud. So please have a look at the next slide, and then we'll show you the conclusion of this poll. Uh, and then you can see, indeed, this is an adenoma, and you're right, it is a tubular adenoma. So if you're interested, one more to go, just to keep in time. So again, we start the poll and we show you the polyp. What about the surface pattern? If it's regular, is it irregular? Then you look at the pit pattern. Yeah, is it well structured? Are the pits round or tubular or tubular villus? Or do you see any ulceration? Sometimes you see in a polyp something like this, which is called a valet, uh, a valet sign. Doug Rex has described this a couple of years ago in GIE. So we start the poll now, please. And we start the poll, we show you the answers. And the polyp also. Yeah, we have to apologize that sometimes it's moving a little bit, but I feel it is important that everyone is included and uh, not only us as the speakers. So thanks so much again to Sonoscape and um, the ESGE. So most of you have chosen hyperplastic lesion. I'm really impressed. There is, seems to be a very strong learning curve for all of you. So um, we'll have a look at the result. And then when we are going to the result, then we can indeed see 
that this is a hyperplastic lesion. And you are right. And we have one last one to go for you until we come for the final conclusion. And again, we please start the vote clear. So you can see we are looking at the surface pattern morphology. Is it regular or is it irregular? Again, regular means it looks the same like the surrounding colonic mucosa. What about the pit pattern? If it's round or if it's not round? When it's not round, is it tubular? Is it tubular villus? Uh, or is it only villus maybe? And maybe you also see an alteration there. Uh, and then we can come up to a final conclusion. So we can stop the, the, the voting. And thanks so much to all of you participating. It's really great. So we can't see each other in person, but we can act at least with each other. And most of you have seen that this is a tubular villus adenoma. Most of you definitely are saying that this is an adenoma. And then if we go to the final conclusion of this last uh, polyp here, and then you can see that in this case, indeed has been a tubular adenoma, although I agree because there was a little bit of fluid on the polyp that it appears a little bit like floating and therefore it was an impression of a tubular villus one. Of course, in real life, it would look totally different. But I think we have seen indeed endoscopy is effective, but we are missing lesions throughout the whole luminal gastrointestinal tract. At least in the colon, we are missing at least 30% of lesions, what we have learned over the past years. I strongly advocate to read the last guidelines from the ESGE regarding colorectal cancer screening from Professor Hassan. Image enhanced endoscopy using SFI clearly enhances the lesion demarcation and also the detection of lesions. We have seen uh, the idea of the new VIS technology, which allows for an in vivo characterization of lesions. And also we have introduced now for the first time to you the valid classification, which will allow for an exact diagnosis of adenomatous tissue. I think also what we need to show Cesare in the future is the learning curve of this study, because this is something what we have experienced today as well with you. And therefore I thank you very much for your active uh, participation in this webinar. Thank you very much. Helmut, a great um, uh, presentation and uh, we congratulate because you are the first uh, to include the velocity in the valid uh, classification. My question to an expert uh, of endoscopy and pathology like you, are we ready to replace histology with endoscopy prediction in our clinical practice? Maybe in your office, or do you still see a lot of barriers in implementing endoscopy prediction to replace histology? Can artificial intelligence help in this? Thank you. I think it's a very important question, most important one indeed. I definitely, I strongly believe that uh, by using image enhanced endoscopy like the VIS technology and the new valid classification, definitely we can do in vivo characterization of colorectal lesions. The barrier will be the learning curve. So we, it's not that one can start immediately. We have seen it in the results as well. But in order to increase the learning curve, and this is very exciting, I think definitely that in the future, we maybe can use artificial intelligence to increase the learning curve and to help us even more to predict histology yeah. uh, in real time. Definitely, I strongly believe this shapes the future of endoscopy and the valid classification is a very important step for this. Thank you very much. So at least we want to see something new. So we have seen many things today already. Ch Professor Hassan has shown us fantastic uh, videos and uh, fantastic new ideas of the new guidelines. I've shown you the valid classification. Now we are learning from Professor Negrano from Bucharest about dragons, I think. No, it's not dragons, but you're talking not a game of thrones, but the game of Crohn. So we want to learn from you about the latest data on endoscopy in patients suffering from inflammatory bowel disease. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helmut. Thank you, everyone, for this uh, wonderful webinar. And uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Sonoscape, for inviting me, and thank you, ESGE. I will uh, discuss about uh, SFI in uh, IBD. So uh, digital chromo in IBD and maybe some artificial intelligence and how can we predict histology and maybe improve our attitude towards the patients. So what's with this uh, new concept of uh, target? 
We got this from cardiology with their targets on cholesterol and uh, hypertension. And then our colleagues in rheumatology proved, at least in pediatric population, if we start early, if we follow up uh, on a proactive manner our patients, we can uh, really predict and stop the damage in the joints. So this was the concept. We imported this in uh, IBD. And the target for the moment is uh, the deep remission. And the deep remission, as uh, it's uh, defined uh, now in 2020, includes complete uh, mucosal healing. And everybody knows sometimes how far we are from this, uh, from this concept. And endoscopy still has a paramount role because it can show this mucosal healing. And I show you here some uh, old study before the anti-TNFs that proved that uh, mucosal healing really is important because bears the prognosis for these patients regarding hospitalization and also surgeries and quality of life. So uh, we want to act in this window of opportunity and maybe in the future to act here before the lesions um, become evident. And um, this CALM study really boiled the, the waters uh, two years ago uh, because it changed a little bit the way we look at our patients. And we moved from, uh, let's say, more uh, expectant uh, position and uh, based on clinical symptoms and the uh, patient coming to us to a more proactive position to act uh, based on endoscopy and on biomarkers to alter the treatment. And this is not only good for the patients in terms of prognosis and changing their uh, natural history of disease, but also apparent to be cost-effective. We know that there is a dissociation between biomarkers and uh, clinical symptoms. And we also know that there is a dissociation, as you can see here, only 31% of the patients has uh, uh, real uh, mucosal uh, healing. So there is a, a distance between endoscopy and what uh, the patient feels. So endoscopy uh, it really remains uh, very important in the treatment and guiding the therapy. It bears a prognostic role and uh, really can change the therapy. Well, we can optimize, escalate or de-escalate and of course, we know from the STORY trial, it's very important in uh, stopping therapy because we know that if we have mucosal healing, we can attempt to stop therapy with uh, some good uh, results. We know that white light has uh, the weak points uh, of not really seeing some subtle changes, uh, some inflammation, and a lot of ink uh, was uh, drawn uh, to this uh, in the debate to classical chromo. And then we have digital chromo endoscopy for the last, uh, let's say, 15 years. And we have even a score from the Yakuchi, from Marietta Yakuchi's uh, site. Uh, it's called the Picasso. And uh, apparently it seems uh, it has a good uh, reliability between raters and also it correlates well with histology. All the manufacturers, uh, you have here uh, two studies by Kudo and uh, by Silvio Danese in Milan with uh, NBI that uh, really reveals uh, subtle lesions and inflammation. Uh, Professor Neumann beautifully showed in this uh, study that eye scan can uh, show uh, some uh, modifications that can predict there is inflammation there, although the patient is asymptomatic. And you have uh, his, uh, this uh, Japanese study with the data with LCI, so Fujinon, that also proves uh, this kind of light, special light, can improve the diagnosis uh, of subtle inflammation in patients apparently asymptomatic. So in real life, how can we use digital uh, chromoendoscopy? Uh, it's very important to really change our therapy and uh, to predict recurrence. And uh, after all, this is very useful in terms of uh, pharmacoeconomics and uh, really prescribing the good drugs and really knowing how to stop the drugs when needed, in this way, uh, avoiding uh, risk of infection, for example, or cancer. 
the, the discussion is very complicated and every one of you knows that the scores were designed for activity and not really for uh, um, severity and mucosal healing. The data is conflicting and I uh, selected only a few studies to show you that assess CD between zero and two might be a target or also in uh, the extend trial, a score below five or in the sonic uh, trial, just a reduction with 50%. So how strict should uh, we be? I think the answer will be uh, in the future. I show you these images of uh, white light and SVI in a Crohn's patient. You see deep uh, lesions, uh, severe ulcerations. And when using SVI, you can see that the quality of the image and the demarcation and the inflammation is really uh, easier to see and better visible. What about post-operative monitoring? We have a lot of patients um, uh, that had surgery and we know that most of them will uh, relapse and will relapse soon. We propose them to come to colonoscopy in six months in order to start the treatment uh, if needed because we know that if we do not treat the right patients, uh, almost 80% will uh, recur in their disease. Not every ulceration should be treated, of course, and you have this uh, definition proposed by the pontiffs of IBD, the IOIBD group. Only the lesions uh, I2B should be treated, so more than five of those, of those lesions. So you have this image in a young male that um, I have as a patient, and using SVI, you see that there is more clear demarcation. You can guess uh, a degree of stenosis here, and uh, maybe you would feel like treating this patient and not letting things like that. You have here another patient with a funny montage, but the surgery is at the beginning. But when using the SVI, you can see here that the lesions are more clearly demarcated and at least in this area, inflammation is more visible. Are things simpler in UC? Maybe they are, maybe it's simpler to predict. And uh, I read with pleasure a recent study this month about the colon capsule endoscopy in UC and the patients that had the a low score on colon capsule, so mucosal healing had a better prognosis, is the same in endoscopy. You see here some white light in a patient that is completely asymptomatic during his treatment. If we look carefully with SVI here and here, you see some degree of inflammation and maybe an exulceration here with VIST. So I wouldn't feel comfortable to stop Maybe I will ask the patient to come uh, soon. SVI uh, here in this uh, images clarifies the scarring. So here I think uh, patient is on the good, good course. And here you can see that SVI uh, shows some degree of uh, mucosal bleeding and submucosal bleeding. So in this patient, clearly there is some activity. We uh, evaluated only 12 patients that are uh, in remission and uh, we showed that using SVI and targeting our biopsies show a degree of uh, histology of active inflammation and infiltrate uh, in the submucosa of 90% as compared to only 50% uh, using white light. So I think it's in the eye of the endoscopist, so it's very important to bear this in mind, but also to use the right light. Is it doable in the real life? You see here a study that shows that only 10% of colonoscopies really are using a scoring system in the real life. This is a French study, a little bit old. And here are some data from uh, Berlin that shows endoscopic healing in the treat to target monitoring is not as used as we would like. Not even the patients accept endoscopies in a proactive manner. I think this is a problem of the future and maybe the way we explain and uh, resources and access. So, um, 
Future issues in digital uh, Chromo, mm, we have to increase their use. We have to discuss about semiology and maybe a scoring system that will be applicable uh, universally, no matter of the manufacturer of the scope. We have to validate in a more um, extensive trials to see if these lesions can really alter the prognosis of the patient the relapses or the frequency of the hospitalization and the recurse to surgery. And maybe Professor Neumann, as the chairman of the IBD group at the World Endoscopy Organization, and ESGE will increase the collaboration with ECHO, and maybe we can work this out uh, in the near future. So, dear colleagues, dear chairman, uh, I think digital chromo is very important. Of course, it's in the eye of the endoscopist, but with the right tool, uh, with a good endoscope, with the good light, we can even predict histology and see which patients need to be followed up more closely in this uh, treat to target way we use now is the best dogma we have for the moment. And of course, I invite you all to participate uh, in our studies and uh, really to increase uh, the, the bond between uh, ESG and the uh, ECHO organization. So thank you. I hope I stick to the time because it's very crowded night and very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucien. Absolutely awesome learning from you about the game of Crohn's. And I think uh, indeed patients with inflammatory bowel disease, they are so challenging, is it? It's uh, absolutely awesome listening to you and to the new ideas. And um, you have intensively talked about image enhanced endoscopy and prediction of mucosal healing and deep clinical remission. What about uh, detection in the future? So at the moment, the guidelines still refer to optical um, chroma endoscopy, so, so to um, so dye based chroma endoscopy, so to traditional dye spraying for detection of uh, lesions in IBD. Do you think in the future we can rely on SFI maybe in this specific circumstance as well? I'm sure we will, because if we ask, uh, we all talk about it and very few are really doing it uh, in real uh, time, except for the patients with all diseases when we have to do chromo. But this is more elegant, uh, it's easy to do, it's, uh, you push a button, and I'm sure we will have soon enough algorithms that will help and maybe we can validate this in, uh, in future work. So I think it's there. Thank you so much, Lucien. Fantastic talk again. And also, I hope to see you very soon again and mm -hmm. to visit Bucharest also. And um, I've visited already Malaga a couple of times and uh, Predator, you have been a fantastic host all the time. You have such a fantastic hospital. You're doing so many cases. You told me you have done a couple of ESDs today as well. And of course, there could be no better expert than you today talking about third space endoscopy. Uh, and talking about the trends in endoscopic uh, submucosal dissection techniques. So we are so keen to learn now from you about the latest innovations in this field. And I also know that you're using the sonoscapes uh, scopes now for, for a very long time and doing very, very difficult procedures with those scopes. And of course, we are very keen to learn from you about the trends now of endoscopic submucosal resection techniques. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Helmut. Um, first, I want to thank to Sonoscape and ESG for the opportunity to participate in this meeting. It's really a honor for me to be, to be with such a great college. And I want to speak about, um, yeah, I want to speak about ESD and as I see the future of the, of the ESD. As you can see here in this uh, slide, the number of uh, articles in ESD and the interest in ESD has become higher and higher with the years. And as you know, the, um, the standard ESD is now the, the gold standard in, in the management, in the managing of big or advanced lesion. You uh, please note here in this uh, esophageal cancer how we use the SVI mode of the sonoscape uh, system. I really like uh, this mode for the, for detection. For uh, see the the edge of uh, this esophageal cancer um, to to make easier to mark. And as I say, the standard ESD is now the gold standard to remove this kind of lesion. 
And it's true that this is uh, technically demanding and it's true that um, it takes you time. But once you are used to, to do this kind of technique, you are going to be able to treat in a safer and better way your patient. But in this uh, presentation, I don't want to speak about a regular ESD. I want to speak about the future of this of these techniques. So, uh, because uh, normally the people uh, feel uh, move in in the area where uh, where we feel uh, comfortable is the comfort zone, and in gastrointestinal endoscopy, the comfort zone is the intraintestinal space, and it's limited by the muscular propria. So everything inside the, the muscular is propria um, is a safer place. You feel okay working here, but outside the muscular is propria is the incognita, is the deep space. Uh, you know uh, we have uh, the first state, uh, space in endoscopy is the intraintestinal space. The second space is the extraintestinal space, the peritoneum. And the third space is the submucosal space. And we have a lot of uh, experience now in, in third space endoscopy. Uh, and as you know, with regular EM, EMR and, or ESD, you can remove lesion located in the mucosa or even in the submucosal layer. But for lesion located in the muscular is propria or in the serosa, you have to do different techniques mm, different from ESD to remove uh, this kind of lesion. So you have some time to break the barrier, and this is what we are going to speak about. For certain cer cer space endoscopy, we have a lot of techniques, and all of them are very similar. The more used technique of certain space is uh, point for acalasia, but we have uh, G point for gastroparesia, C point for thinker. Uh, we have techniques to, to, to treat uh, subepithelial tumor we are going to see, or even stenosis. And the more usual technique that we have in third space is POEM. I'm going to speak very, very few about uh, POEM because all of you know it. Only in this slide I want to show you is a, is a slide from my good friend Eduardo Albeni. Like any kind of achalasia type 1, type 2, or type 3, or even Jackhammer esophagus can be treated um, with POEM better even than uh, Heller myotomy. What I want to show you is a video of gastric poem. All the all the tunnel technique uh, poem, uh, G poem, C poem are very similar. You have to do a, a mucosal entry. You have to create a tunnel until you reach the target that you are going to treat. Uh, treat the target and then close the mucosal entry. So in this case of gastric uh, poem, we are creating the mucosal entry. After we create, sorry, after we create the mucosal entry we can dissect, creating the submucosal tunnel until we reach the pyloric arch. And once we reach the pyloric arch, you can see here the pyloric arch. In the G point, what we do is cut completely the, the muscle fibers of the pyloric arch to remove the tension. And you can see in this uh, video how we can go step by step, very precise, very controlled, removing any kind of muscle fiber and cutting completely the pyloric arch. Normally in G-point, we cut the, um, the pylorus and one or two centimeters of uh, body muscular is propia. I wanna show you the final result of the myotomy we are finishing. You can see here the pyloric car completely closed. And then, because I have made a perforation here and I have the mucosal entry here, I only need to close the mucosal entry. And with four, five, six regular clip, normally you have uh, done the work. The poem um, poem are very similar in concept. Uh, the next uh, technique I want to speak about is full thickness because I'm totally in love with the treatment of subepithelial tumor. Are two kinds of different techniques, the exposed and the non-exposed technique. In the exposed technique, you are going to create, or maybe you, you need to create a perforation of the muscle layer. Um, and we have a tunnel technique, like stair, are very similar to the poem, and non-tunnel technique, submucosal excavation, and the 
And in non-exposed technique, you are going to have no perforation because you are going to close the perforation before you do it. And in this moment, the only device that we can use regularly is the Obesco full thickness resection device. I'm going to pass through the full thickness because it's um, all of you know, but I want to, to stay in the exposed full thinner resection. Um, in the exposed full thinner resection, as I said before, maybe you have a perforation, so you have to keep in mind that you will need to close the perforation of the patient for not to have a, a complication. And the improvement in the skills in this field has allowed that we develop better techniques to close the perforation and that we have lost our fear to make a perforation. For a, a small perforation, normally with regular clips, the work is done. For perforation bigger than one, maybe two centimeter, probably it's better to, do, to, to use um, Obesco over the scope clip. Um, for perforation bigger, yeah, maybe you, you or a good technique to use is a loop and the clip technique. In non-exposed uh, technique, um, sorry, in non-tunnel technique, um, endoscopic submucosal excavation, the technique is very similar to the regular ESD. You are going to start dissection the submucosal plane, and then you are going to continue the, the mucosal through the muscularis propria until you completely release the lesion from the uh, muscular bed. Maybe you need to do the perforation. It's better if you try to avoid. And I want to show you these cases. All the therapeutic procedure I do with the sonoscape uh, therapeutic upper gastroscope, uh, because he has a big working channel and has uh, amazing retroflex maneuver, maneuverability. So in this case, it's a gist located in the G junction. It's a two centimeter gist, and it's in the submucosal plane. In this case, I have removed before the, the mucosal layer. You see the retroflex view of the, of the lesion. And now we are performing a deeper dissection. You can see how the tumor is in the, um, in the surface of the muscularis propria. So you start to, to cut the muscularis propria and close your finger for not to have a perforation. If you have a perforation, you have to close, but always is better try to, to avoid. And you can see how it's very um, uh, easy to differentiate the subepithelial tumor from the regular um, muscular layer. Step by step, uh, we exit the, the tumor from the, from the muscular layer. And at the end, you are going to see the, the tumor hanging from a little part of uh, little fibers of submucosa. The, this technique, uh, maybe, uh, maybe you think it's very time consuming or very difficult to do, but it takes uh, one hour and a half, I think, to, to, to do completely. And in this case, I have a no, no complete perforation of the esophagus, so no need to close. And this is the specimen, uh, was a uh, yes, um, the lesion was removed completely. And my favorite technique about uh, superpetial tumor resection is a stair. A stair was described by Sue in 2012, one year after the same author described the submucosal excavation. And the technique is very similar to the, to the regular uh, poem. You create a mucosal incision at some distance of the lesion you are going to treat. Normally four or five centimeters, you create the submucosal tunnel until you read the lesion. And once you, you read the lesion, you detach the lesion from the muscularis propria. And in this technique, it doesn't matter the, the deep the lesion is because you, it doesn't matter really you have a perforation because you are going to close the entry of the tunnel only. And it's a very safe technique. Mm, and as for that, you are not going to need a, a full thickness closer. Normally, with regular clip, you are going to have, to have the, the work done. The only um, bad part of the, of the technique is that it's difficult to remove lesion uh, with more than four centimeters. This is a schema of the technique, but you are going to see a video of a subepithelial tumor located in the serosa. This was again a um, GIS tumor. 
is what's located here in the upper part of the gastric body. And in this case, I made the, the mucosal entry in the G junction, and this was a mistake. In this case, it's easier to do the mucosal entry in the esophagus and go through the cardias uh, to the lesion. But anyway, we do the mucosal entry, and we create the tunnel and the submucosal layer. Let's note here in the gastric cardia, you are going to find a lot of big vessel. So in this area, we have to do a very careful dissection for avoid bleeding. The vessels are very big. And this is the idea. Create the mucosal channel, leave the mucosal, the mucosal plane totally intact for close the perforation, and continue the dissection until you, you read the, um, the lesion. I want to show you, unfortunately, I have to change the, the, the scopy tower because we need for other case. But I want to show you how difficult it is to see sometimes the tumor because it's very deep. So in this case, you see the, the tumor is very deep. It's practically impossible to, to see. OK. The gist is located here, practically is outside the stomach. So again, carefully we dissect plane by plane the, the mucosal plane. And soon we have a perforation and we know that the lesion is more outside the stomach than inside the stomach. So we have to continue the, the dissection uh, through the peritoneal cavity. This is the, the wall of the stomach and the lesion is hanging out. And at the end, we remove completely the, the lesion. And it's a round lesion, so the lesion drops in the peritoneum. And I have to go with the scope to find the lesion that was located between the liver and the gastric wall is here, uh, checking outside the, the lesion. And then it's so easy that uh, the closed perforation, the mucosal entry, like any poem. Maybe you think it's a very aggressive technique, but the patient was discharged home next day, the, the next day. This is the specimen. And uh, when we use the submucosal excavation or a stair, for me, the, um, for be clear, if you can use, I think that if you can use a stair, it's always better to do a stair. And you can use a stair in all the esophagus and in all the areas of the gastric, uh, gastric uh, stomach, uh, but in the upper gastric cardia and the lesser and the distal lesser curvature, you have to use submucosal excavation. If you can use, uh, if you can use um, a stent, it's always better. Only one, um, only one article for you is a meta-analysis of the efficacy of the stent. Uh, we have 1,041 patients, uh, complete resection. 97, uh, block resection 94, um, and complication 4. And the last technique I have for you, I'm finishing the presentation. Um, I think it will be the future of the specialty too, is a treatment for the girl, because it's a very prevalent uh, disease and we don't have a good solution for girl, no endoscopy or, or even surgical solution. And this is a technique uh, described by uh, Iroue, is uh, arms and ref reflux mucosectomy. And this is my change of the technique because uh, I use a multiband uh, device to, to resect the, the submucosal, uh, the gastric submucosa. And the idea is to, to resect in front view or in retroflex view um, the most of the gastric um, subcardial area to create um, an stenosis that helps the patient to have uh, less reflux. I want to show you the final aspect only. And this is how we feel the, the arms technique. It takes uh, 25 minutes to do. I'm finishing the, the presentation. What uh, future advances do we need? Uh, we need um, uh, better and uh, safer closing device. We need more data um, on efficacy, infection, bleeding, or any kind of tumor. And we need to know with the more studies what uh, will be the, the place for endoscopic resection for this, uh, this kind of tumor. 
uh, in front of the surgical um, resection. And finishing, sorry, finishing the exploration, finishing the, the presentation, I think third space technique uh, have, uh, has uh, emerged as a less in invasive alternative to surgical treatment for gastroparesia, diverticulum, acalasia, or subepithelial tumor. And we are going to see a big uh, development of techniques in these areas. And maybe you think that doing uh, this kind of uh, uh, techniques is as difficult as do uh, this Rubik's Cube, but with a lot of patience, at the end of the day, you will come to do it, the technique fantastically. So for me, finish, and thank you very much for the, your attention. Wow, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Pedro. What a fantastic discussion and uh, talk. Unbelievable. So uh, for me, it's always so impressive. And I've seen you so many times live and we've done cases together as well. Um, you're really doing the most, most, most difficult procedures. And I'm always wondering, do you ever need your surgeon? Do, do you have a surgeon in your hospital or are you doing everything just uh, from the luminal side? Yes, I, I have a sergeant with me, but I never call him. I, I guess, yeah, you're not the best friends. I, I, don't, I don't want to see the sergeant <laughs> in my endoscopy room. It's better not to see. Yeah, no, I, I have, I have a, no need to operate. Only one case of a colonic ESD. I have a perforation in another place different for the, for the, what the lesion was. But for this kind of uh, lesion I, I have shown today, I never use uh, surgical. Ah, that's fantastic. And what, what we have also seen from you, so doing those most uh, difficult cases, but I've also seen uh, you're mostly using the sonoscape scopes for those procedures. So regarding the maneuverability, before we have already seen the non-inferiority trial regarding, you know, the key performance parameters um, uh, in endoscopy, that sonoscape is not inferior to other brands like uh, Olympus and uh, Pentax Medical. So what do you feel from the therapeutic side? Is it inferior to use a scope or I, I guess not because you're mostly using it for those most difficult procedures like submucosal tunnel endoscopic resection and so on? Not today. I only use uh, sonoscape for therapeutic, upper therapeutic. And I have uh, Olympus in my hospital. I have the two, the two systems in the same room. I have 118 Olympus and I can use what I want. I always use a sonoscape because uh, for me it has better maneuverability. Okay. And therapy is a uh, gastroscope is very thin. So it's very, it's very easy to move in the channel. Okay, Pedro, thank you so much again. A fantastic talk and uh, very exciting. Uh, unfortunately, we are not able to see the talk of uh, Professor Giovannini, but at least I want to show you that indeed we are pushing. We do not only want to push the boundaries, but we are pushing the boundaries of endoscopic excellence and even Sonoscape is doing this. And, but also there is um, a new thing what is coming. So Sonoscape is now also introducing new scopes and those are um, a linear scope, uh, echo endoscopes as well. Uh, and this is also something what we definitely want to show you. So uh, very soon there will be a radial echo endoscope and a linear error echo uh, endoscope as well from Sonoscape company. So much more to come in the upcoming uh, months. So uh, at the end, I would say it is now my topic to close this uh, webinar series. Again, I want to thank all the participants. First of all, I want to thank all the people outside for joining us here for this ESGE satellite webinar series. Uh, definitely, I want to thank very special today, even the ESGE and the people in the back, which is David Inc., but also especially uh, Claire Guy. Uh, we have done a uh, very uh, spontaneous job today, and definitely I want to highlight those people in the back. Without this massive support today from the ESGE, this webinar would have not been possible. So thank you so much, Dave and uh, Claire, for your fantastic support and all the best to the colleagues in Munich. And uh, we are very happy that we have the ESG as our society supporting our passion and pushing the boundaries of endoscopic excellence. I want to thank uh, Sonoscape company for bringing us all together, learning together and uh, for, for making this possible. And um, also, of course, I want to thank all my colleagues here and come back live, please show your faces to, to the people Pedro, Lucia, and Cesare, and uh, maybe even uh, Claire and Dave, you're also there. You can show your face as well because you have done such a great job. 
We are not alone. It's challenging times, but we are not alone. Thank you so much. Stay safe and see you soon. Bye-bye.